Today uh, we're offering a, our second summer quarter program and we have with us a gentleman whom you've probably read about many times in the newspapers or heard about on broadcasts. He uh, was ordained a Marian old priest in 1961 and he studied at the University of uh, the state of New York. Uh, he studied the cooperative movement in An Antig Antigonish. Antigonish, Nova Scotia, and where he was sent to uh, Guatemala and named pastor in 1962. He was elected uh, in his last year there to the newly formed Diocesan Senate and uh, he founded and worked with agricultural, consumer credit, and savings cooperatives. He directed clinics, dispensaries, schools, uh, and adult educational programs. And uh, probably the most outstanding thing he did there was to start a land reform program. Uh, the greatest need, uh, yet the greatest danger, uh, for anybody working in Guatemala or most any Latin American nation. Uh, he was expelled from Guatemala in December 1967. He fled to Mexico where he was jailed, beaten, and threatened with death. And from there he was illegally uh, deported to the United States in April of this year. Uh, I'm very anxious, as I'm sure all of you are, to hear why Father Arthur Melville believes that revolution is the only answer to Latin American problems. Father Melville? Thanks, Jim. That about sums up the talk. If there's any questions? <laughs> 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 well, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, I guess you're all acquainted with uh, Latin countries in some way or another. I'll give a, a brief background on what I was involved in in Guatemala, maybe going into a little more detail than Jim. I went there in 61, and the problems of a Latin country are obvious. You don't have to be in a country such as Guatemala long to realize that the majority of the people are living in poverty, living in misery. As Jim said, I readily became involved in cooperative work. As you know, a priest, a missionary priest, goes to a foreign country, and his principal work ordinarily would be that of uh, administering the sacraments. And I, of course, went with that idea and did, during my seven years in Guatemala, administer the sacraments to the people, but I found out that the sacraments do not answer the needs of the people, that they have to play a part in the life of the Latin people, there's no doubt about that, but that a priest, a Christian, a humanitarian, has got to work on a social level with the people. And that I did. The first work that I became involved in was the establishing credit union or credit unions. And uh, I, discussing with the people their problems, trying to get at the base of their problems, came to a conclusion with them that there was a great need for credit unions in the area I was working in. I was in Huehuetenango, it's one of the 23 states of Guatemala, one of the most heavily populated states and yet one of the most backward. And there the people, we may say the average man, earns 30 or 40 cents a day. Now we may think that this is sufficient for them at their standard of living, but we've got to realize that the cost of living in Guatemala is higher than the cost of living here in the United States. We have fathers of families receiving 30 or 40 cents a day. Well, we started the credit unions, I say, because these people, in times of need, taking out a loan, were borrowing money at 10% per month. And through credit unions, we were able to facilitate loans to the people at a just interest rate, 1% per month. And we organized several of these uh, credit unions and reorganized several that al already existed and felt that this was really a good work. You know, I myself felt I was making a great contribution. But uh, each time we became involved in a project, we would try to re-examine it during the years and 
In re-examining the credit unions, we found that we were not working with the masses. We were working with the elite of the poor, those who were capable of saving. But the majority, of course, were not capable of saving. And we weren't touching their lives through credit unions. We went into agricultural cooperatives. And here, once again, we made a slight contribution, but we were not capable of, of changing the lives of the people. We were not capable of lifting them out of their misery. Many families of the area that I worked in, I was in an area with 17,000 people, 17,000 people in the parish. And uh, we were able to raise the income, the annual income of the people, of many of the families of the area, 100% or 200%. And once again, one gets the feeling that he's being very successful. But if a family is, has an income of $50 a year, and that is raised to $100 a year, or 150 that family still lives in misery. Well, we were constantly trying to get at the basis of the problems of the people. And uh, every time we would examine our projects or evaluate again the existing problems, we were constantly going back to land, that the people had to have land. As you probably know, 2% of the people of Guatemala own 80% of the arable land. This is an agricultural society, so the average farmer does not have land to farm. He has to work for a, a large landowner. And of course, he becomes enslaved to this large landowner, becomes very dependent upon him. Well, we went into, as Jim said, we went into adult education and we set up uh, any number of adult education centers. And this was principally to teach uneducated people, illiterate people, to read and write. And we felt we were having great success in this also. But as we got people organized, as we uh, educated ourselves through the organizations that we formed, we were finding oppression from the, or meeting oppression from the oligarchical class. Those who control the country, the 2%, those who own the country, those who make up the government, do not want the people of Guatemala to progress. If they are to progress, if they are to unite, if they are to show strength, they will go on to look for what is justly theirs. And what they principally want, as I say, is land. So organization of the peasant in Guatemala is a threat to the oligarchical class. The oligarchical class, of course, is sustained and defended by the army. Guatemala today has a very well-trained army. It has been trained by the United States. Not only trained, but armed and financed by the United States. And this well-armed and trained army in the little country of Guatemala, almost five million inhabitants, does not exist to ward off a foreign oppressor. El Salvador or Honduras isn't about to attack Guatemala. The army only exists to contain the people. Anytime there is organization, of course, there is uprising of the people because they want to lift themselves out of their misery. They want to seek what is justly theirs. The army, as I say, exists only to control and contain the people which it has been doing rather effectively over the years. We went on and, uh, well, in the educational classes for the adults, we had 17 groups going at one time, 17 centers, <coughs> and had trained native teachers, you know, for each group. And uh, an example of the oppression that we met was one day one of our teachers was kidnapped. Now, when someone who is helping the poor in Guatemala, someone who is helping organization, an organization of the peasants in Guatemala is kidnapped or maltreated, you know that the source of the oppression is from the oligarchical class or the army. The people explained to me that five men had entered into their village at one o'clock in the morning. These men were heavily armed, machine guns, automatic rifles, that they were masked, that they in no way identified themselves. They broke into several homes in the village and maltreated the people and threatened them and finally carried off this teacher. Well, when I heard about it, I went to the nearest army base 
and had an opportunity to speak to the officer who had directed that action. And he didn't like the idea that I would become involved in, in this problem of the people. He told me that my work was with candles and rosaries and, and statues and that I shouldn't become involved in the problems of the people, that the army would take care of that. And he told me that I had no right to be organizing these educational groups, that I didn't have the permission of the army. I explained that we were living under a so-called democratically constitutionally elected government and that I did not have to ask the permission of the army. And his answer was that the army of Guatemala ruled the country in time of war or in time of peace and that I had better learn it. Well, I criticized his action, his mode of action, and, and he told me that uh, I shouldn't be so critical because his methods had been taught to him here in the United States at Fort Benning. And he said, the methods that your gringo brothers have taught me, they are now using in Vietnam. Well, he said that they were masked because they might have had to have done some dirty work, he said, in the village. And by masking themselves, no one would be able to identify them. Well, the boy was released and he wasn't harmed. But of course, once again, the army had put fear into the people of, these villi of this village and, of course, had turned the village against the army. We had uh, further clashes with this officer in the future along similar lines. But uh, we were being effective, I believe, only in that the people were coming to realize that through organization they had strength and they were capable of meeting the oligarchical class almost on their, on their own level. For example, in the sale of coffee, one organization, one coffee co-op, was able to cut out completely the middleman in the sale of coffee and sell directly to the exporters. We were trying to introduce the first industry into the state of Huehuetenango. It is completely without industry, and we were programming to introduce the first industry, that of legal uh, alcohol making a rum and uh, we were told once again by the oligarchical class that people would be killed if we were to continue on with this program we were at a point where we were soliciting from the government uh, a license to set up this factory and there are three or four families in Guatemala that control the liquor industry and we were advised that people would be killed well this threat of killing is common in Guatemala as you know Beating is common, kidnapping is common. And there is no more violent a group than, than that of the, the rightists. Even here in the United States, I see the same thing. That a rightist group can really be a very, very violent group, as they are in Guatemala. As you know, the rightist terrorist group Mano Blanca last year killed over 2,000 people, students and peasants in Guatemala last year. And it isn't simply murdering these people, but it means torturing and murdering. Well, as the people felt strength, they wanted to go on with the organization, <coughs> with the organizations. We had small labor groups formed that, uh, real small, from 10 to 50 men, and uh, these were showing a little bit of success also. We went on finally to go into the land reform project and of course there was great interest in this. The people readily flocked to any kind of an organization that shows hope of success. The Latin, to me, really looks for communal life. He is a generous person, although poor. He is generous, he wants to share, he wants to work with his fellow man. And because we had shown success in various organizations, anytime we set up a new organization, the people readily flocked to it. Well, the present president of Guatemala, Julio Cesar Mendez Montenegro, had been elected in what is called commonly democratic elections. His program or his platform was that of land reform. And the gentleman has made no effort to bring about any kind of a land reform program. But what he did was he aroused the interest of the people in land reform. And we saw that Julio Cesar wasn't going to do anything in this area. 
we started studying ourselves to see how we could possibly be effective. We found the Guatemalan law permits the people of a township to organize themselves for the distribution of the land of their own township. And there were four towns or townships in the parish I was in. So one of the towns wanted to have this pilot program. And 400 men of that, uh, of that township organized themselves. We began studying with the help of a law student from the National University. We had many uh, university students working with us, by the way, which was uh, a rather unusual setup in Guatemala that the, law, uh, that the uh, university student would move out to the campo and work with the peasants. And uh, I must say we had quite a dedicated group. Some of them left off their university studies for a time. Some of them cut off their university studies completely in order to dedicate themselves to the work in the campo. Well, with this group of 400 men, we discussed and studied the mode of distributing land, of cultivating land uh, cooperatively, of marketing uh, crops cooperatively, and of using the profits cooperatively for possibly housing projects or something like that. And as we reached the point of petitioning from the government the juridical personality needed in order to empower the group for, to distribute the land, the oligarchy again was threatening. And they were becoming violent. People were being beaten and jailed. And yet the group wanted to go on. It was feeling its strength. And it did not want to be turned back again. Well, the oligarchy finally named seven of us to die. Sentenciado. We were sentenced to death. The five of the director board of the group and the law student and myself. And of course we had to discuss once again if we were to continue on and the people said we go on. So we did. And uh, the vice president was then named to be the first of the seven to die and, and he came to me at that point and told me and he was nervous and shook and everything. And, and I said, well, do you want to go on? What, do you want to step out of the group or go to some other area, get into another project? And he was a very valiant man, a beautiful man, 58 years old. And he said, no, they will kill me, but we have to go on. And that's exactly what happened. Three days later, he was beaten to death. Now, this is interesting because we had witnesses to the killing, to the murder. We presented this case to the courts and yet got nowhere. The murderers, we had 17 witnesses, signed testimony, and the murderers were never questioned on this. And it just points out that the courts and the jails of Guatemala are not for the wealthy, are not for the oligarchical class, but they are for the poor. If a poor man kills the animal of his neighbor, he may be sentenced to five years. But a wealthy man can kill a poor man, and his case will never reach the court. Well. In this particular instance, we asked for help from the president of the country, from the governor, from the judge of the first instance of the state, and never got an answer from any of them. We asked for a medical doctor to come in representing the state to examine the body. He arrived 28 days later. But the people, as I say, wanted to go on, and we did. We were forbidden by the national police to continue sessioning. We had to make another decision. Do we continue sessioning or not? And we did. We did, as you say here, we went underground, sessioned in secret. And we were being watched closely and, as I say, more people being threatened and jailed, beaten. And of course, the uh, local government not in any way assisting the, uh, the organizations that had been established. The local government, by the way, had, had uh, declared that the vice president of the land reform program had died a natural death. The doctor, when he arrived 28 days later, was able to uh, point out that the man had died from blows on the head. But this never helped our case at all. Well, as you know, another group had been working, or groups, other groups had been working since 1960 in Guatemala. They're called the guerrilla groups. And I knew of their effectiveness in organizing people and in changing in a rather minor way up until now some of the social problems of the people. 
And about two years ago, I became very much interested in their work. And I wanted to find out more about it, but I had no way of making contact with the groups. And I used to think to myself, well, it would be nice to get out into the area they're working in and be captured by them and in that way have the opportunity of talking to them, but I never had the courage to do it. But finally, they came to us. They knew of the work we were doing and of the problems we were meeting, and they came. And we started talking with them, discussing with them. And I got to know many of them very well. And I must say that I did not have the right impression of the people who are involved in guerrilla work in Guatemala. I found most of them to be very dedicated people, to have very good and strong principles. And uh, as I say, we had the opportunity of discussing the methods that they, will be, they were using, and uh, the people themselves, during the time that we were discussing and all, were coming to the conclusion that in order to continue on with the work that had been started, the cooperative work, the communal work, they would have to defend themselves also. And because of the oppression, we started going out in groups, that is to say, we wouldn't work, walk the trails alone anymore. And we would try to have an armed person among us any time we did go out. This, of course, helped us greatly. It, once that became known to the local oligarchy that there were armed people among us, this did cut down on the oppression. But the army was moving in. It was, uh, as they say, vigilandonos. It was watching us all the time. Um, it reached a point that any time I went into church and there would be a group of people in church, that is, say, for a mass or something like that, there would be a person in church there also representing the government, you know, just to make sure that uh, nothing was being said against the government or against the oligarchical class. Well, the people, I say the people, many people came to the conclusion that they had to arm themselves once and for all. This means going into uh, a guerrilla group. They were not capable of continuing on with their legal work of organizing, of progressing through legal means, without meeting this constant oppression. And as the people came to this conclusion, I came to the same conclusion that I, who was working with them, who had been accepted by them, who had been invited into the guerrilla movement also, that I had an obligation, if I was a dedicated person, I had an obligation to participate in this work also. And as you know, I was not the only priest that came to this conclusion. There was a pretty good group of us, of priests and nuns. Uh, this was our work was discovered and our intentions were discovered, were revealed by one of the priests who was in the movement. Uh, I think out of fear, he spoke to the wrong people. I really don't know what happened to the man. And uh, it was a betrayal, no matter why he did it or how he did it, it was a betrayal. And myself and my brother Tom and a nun, Sister Miriam Peter, who is today my sister-in-law, we were kicked out of Guatemala last December 21st. And then a few days later, Father Blaise Bompain was kicked out, and it went on until we're now 10 who have been kicked out, out of Guatemala, 10 uh, Marino priests and sisters. There are others there, of course, who are still very sympathetic to the revolutionary movement. Whether they will be able to participate actively in it or whether they will be kicked out of Guatemala also, I don't know. But uh, the movement goes on. Guatemala is going through the revolutionary process. It's still in the, the first stages. The guerrillas consider their prime work today to be that of educating people. They, of course, have got to have their encounters with the forces of the army. But their prime work is that of getting out to the villages and talking to the people. They have, in the past, been effective in showing the people that they are working for the good of Guatemala. I could give a, a few instances that may be interesting of the approach of a guerrilla front. In one village that they went into, the local exploiter, the large landowner, the money lender of the area, he had the three water sources of the area on his plantation. The people were not permitted onto his farm to draw water, although he had an abundance, surplus of water. They had to walk two kilometers to a river to get their water. 
And this is 1,100 people around this farm, living around the farm. And this has been going on for years. And yet the guerrilla front arrived, talked to the people, learned of this problem, approached the landowner and explained to him that water existed for all men and not just for the wealthy. And that the people would be permitted onto his farm to draw the water needed. And of course the man began cooperating with the people. He had to. Uh, the people then begin to think, well, our government has never done anything like this for us. They have never wanted to change the ways of the oligarchical class. And yet this group of people, small group of people, come into our village and they, in a matter of minutes, are able to change the existing situation. The guerrillas, of course, explain that they have to come armed because they are under surveillance of the army. The army is trying to kill them. They call themselves armed educators. That term is actually used. And you can see the logic in arming themselves, no doubt, that I also reached a point in my trying to educate myself and educate the people with whom I was working, reached that stage that in order to continue on, I would have had to have armed myself also if I was to continue on. If I was to continue on without arming myself, I would have died in doing what I was doing. Another instance would be the a guerrilla front, and once again it's a small group moving into a village where the local money lender is, is uh, gaining an interest of say 15% per month from the poor. And he is approached by the people in the guerrilla front and it is explained to him that he will lend now at such and such an interest, maybe 2 or 3% per month. And of course he completes, he goes along with what they say. And the people think, well why is it that this group can come in? And they can bring about uh, justice in, in this small phase of our life. Yet the government has never tried to do anything. Of course, the guerrillas, in talking to the people, explain what their government is doing. That the, Who makes up their government? That the government is made up of the oligarchical class, of the 2%. And that they, the poor masses of Guatemala, are working for the 2%. And that the government, in turn, is not working for the people. Well, as you know, they in various areas of Guatemala, they have got strong support from the peasants. But the army has made it very difficult for the people who live in, er in an area where there is support for the guerrilla movement. There are villages in Guatemala today that have no adult men. They have just been wiped out for showing sympathy towards the guerrilla movement. The counterinsurgency forces in Guatemala have been strong but it's not for us to decide the route that the guerrilla movement or the revolutionary, uh, the revolution in Guatemala is taking. This is for them to decide. There is a good uh, guerrilla force in Guatemala. The people, of course, have been contained by the army, by the oligarchical class. Many are becoming sympathetic towards the revolution. They are going through the steps towards revolution. There's no doubt about it. How they progress, this is up to them. What we, the American people, have got to realize is that we are the first enemy of the Guatemalan people. That the army that contains the people is once again fi is financed, armed, and trained by us. That we do have troops in Guatemala directing their work. That the two men killed in January, Colonel Weber and Lieutenant Commander Monroe, were enemies of the people. And they were condemned to death by the guerrilla front because they were enemies of the people. Time magazine explained very well in January of this year, January 22nd, I believe, the work of Colonel Weber in Guatemala. How he paid hungry men and armed them to go out and kill indiscriminately anyone they judged to be sympathetic to the revolutionary movement. He exploited the destitution of the people. He was well financed. He had a lot of money to work with. He brought in the latest in communications equipment, in helicopters, in armaments. And all this, not to help the people of Guatemala, but to contain them. When we were working on the land reform program, the people frequently reminded me of what my government had done back in 1954. You probably remember that. Jacobo Arbenz was the president of Guatemala. Many people have told me that he was the only president that ever represented the people of Guatemala. Now, Arben started a land reform program in 52. 
And it wasn't a bad reform program, land reform program, as far as he got. He started expropriating land, uncultivated land, from the largest farms in Guatemala. And giving them, in turn, bonds, payable over 20 years, at the value that they themselves stipulated when they made out their first tax forms on the land. Now, as I say, this was all uncultivated land, land that was owned by the oligarchical class that was unused. The largest landowner in Guatemala, of course, is the United Fruit Company. So, well, they cultivate 5% of the land that they have in Guatemala. And so he took some of their land and gave them the bonds and started putting peasants, landless peasants, on that land. He put up to 24,000 people on United Fruit land. But United Fruit shouted the magic word and we all jumped. United Fruit shouted communism, you know. We're being invaded. This hemisphere is being invaded by an international oppressor. And, of course, CIA picked up the shout and State Department picked up the shout. And before we knew it, the Arbenz government was overthrown and that of Castillo Armas was set up. Castillo Armas was a Guatemalan army colonel trained here in the United States. He, with CIA and the private army of United Fruit and other Guatemalans trained here in the United States and with planes from the United States Air Force unmarked, flown by American volunteers, overthrew the government of Jacobo Arbenz, the only government that the people say that ever was theirs in Guatemala. We put up the dictator, Castillo Armas, who was one of the most violent and vicious dictators that Guatemala has seen. He lasted four years before a peasant killed him. But his first act upon taking over the government was to throw off the 24,000 people from United Fruit Land and give it back to our United Fruit Company. Several hundred peasants were killed in the process. But when we started getting involved in land reform ourselves, we were reminded of that. And people used to say, what would happen if we were ever successful in distributing the land of one township? They said, would this not be a, a chain reaction? Another township will have to do the same thing. This had not been tried in Guatemala before. And they used to say to me, how long will it take before your government comes in? And I used to say, I don't know how long it will take, but they will come in. And they had to make the decision, do we go on or not? We have the big white oppressor from the north, you know, do we go on? Are we capable or not? And yet so many who are in the movement feel that they have so much to gain and so little to lose that they will go on. And as you know, our troops in Guatemala are dealing violent blows to the guerrilla movement, and yet it goes on. It doesn't stop. It continues on. Well, we have to ask ourselves, how long can our foreign policy continue as it is? How long can we be the oppressor, the enemy? We actually contribute to the system that is oppressing countries of the third world, oppressing peoples of our own country. We actually participate in the system and, I suppose, benefit by this system. But how long can we go on in this unjust way? They say they'll go on fighting. Jay says that Guatemala won't be successful alone in bringing about its revolution, that we won't permit it. But he says if there were, he calls them Vietnams in Latin America, he says if there were three or four or five coordinated, organized, going on at the same time in Latin America, that possibly they might be successful. It seems that many people are willing to chance it. As I say, those who enter into the guerrilla movement, especially those who are the founders or the first enter into a guerrilla front, are guaranteed death. And yet they go into it knowing that they are going to be killed, but hopefully that they will contribute to a change in the, in the system of, in a country like Guatemala. Now, we have the great fear that, I suppose, we're pretty well indoctrinated. We're victims of this tremendous propaganda system here in the United States, and we're still afraid that the, this international communistic organization will take over our hemisphere. Well, I suppose I should say that the Communist Party in Guatemala is the most reactionary group on the left. 
I mean, if we consider them leftists, we'll have to meet the nationalists of Guatemala. And those who are in the movement are primarily nationalists. They want Guatemala for Guatemala. They haven't accepted Cuban troops. They want to rule their own country. They want the raw materials of Guatemala to be for Guatemalans. They want the bananas and the coffee and the profit from these products to be for Guatemalans. And they're not fighting for an international organization. They, of course, are by nature, the peasant of, of Guatemala is by nature uh, a communal person. As they say, he readily enters into the organizations that benefit his communal life, cooperative work. Now, if we use the word communal, we're all right. We get by. But if we say that this is communist living, then we're in trouble because the American gets afraid when he hears that word that he doesn't understand. Now, these people, the peasant, of course, doesn't understand Marxism or Leninism, but he does understand cooperative work, and this is what he wants. I found that in the existing system, cooperatives cannot be effective. They are the great hope of the future in a country such as Guatemala. Communal living, when the system is changed, when there is a government that represents the people, that works for the good of the people. So we are really containing the people. We put up a big front. We have permitted our industrial military power here to pull the wool over our eyes. Many of us still believe that we are a generous nation trying to help the impoverished peoples of Latin America, but we aren't. We're containing them. Our alliance for progress is a joke, except among Americans. We still believe we're trying to help those people. You know how they say alliance for progress in Spanish. Alianza para el progreso, alliance for progress. But para also means stops. And that's the way the Latin means it. The alliance stops progress. We say, well, why do they criticize us? We are generous. They're biting the hand that's feeding them. And they say, you're not feeding us. We're biting the hand that is exploiting us. And yet, it is so difficult for the American to look into it, to examine, to reevaluate the system that we have here. And to come to the conclusion that we do have this unjust unjustly high standard of living here because we have oppressed so many other peoples. We fall back on Alliance for Progress. Look what we're doing for Latin America, a billion dollars a year into Latin America, and yet we take out a lot more than a billion dollars a year out of Latin America. You know, of the money that goes into the Alliance, very little of it is gift and very little of it is grant. Most of it is loan. And of the money loaned, 85% of it is spent here in the United States. It's got to be spent here in the United States. We're not bolstering the Latin economy. We're bolstering our own economy. The Latin cannot, if they're looking for a manufactured product, he cannot bargain between Germany, Japan, and the United States with the money loaned to him in order to get the best price. No, he has got to buy from the United States at our prices. And you know the money that does reach Latin America cannot be used for the purchase of land. The Alliance for Progress, as it started out, its prime motive for existence was to bring about land distribution in the Latin countries. Today, it is simply impeding the work of land distribution in Latin America. The money that does reach there cannot be used for the purchase of land. This is stipulated in Alliance Loan Contract, that it cannot be used for the purchase of land. It also stipulates that uh, collateral must be put up by the receiver of the money. And who in Latin America is capable of putting up collateral? Once again, the oligarchical class, the ruling class. So the money that does reach Latin America, we are benefiting by that money arriving there, and the wealthy class is benefiting. Our money is not only not filtering down to the poor, it is rather containing the poor. So here's sort of a general outline of what I saw in Guatemala, they say, I worked for change in society, civil society. I worked for change in the Catholic Church. I still am working for change in both these societies, religious and civil, but for that reason, I'm back here. 
But I say we've got to continue on. We've got to try to inform more people. We've got to uh, educate ourselves more as to what we are doing, what our society, what our system is doing. We've got to help ourselves in an organized way come to conviction, come to a conviction of our role, our role in world society and bring about effective changes. Well, uh, let's throw it open now to you and I want your criticisms and observations and questions. Let's see where we go. Yes. Excuse me uh, just a second. Before we start the uh, question and answer period, I'd like to invite all you uh, folks out there to uh, enjoy the uh, coffee and cookies we have over here and keep this as informal as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. The question is, what's the Peace Corps doing down there? Well, you know, an Argentinian said recently, he said, we ought to invite the United States to send all the Peace Corps volunteers possible to Latin America because this is probably the only way we have of educating the American. The Peace Corps, as I see them, is made up mostly of dedicated men and women going there trying to make a contribution, are working at the level of the people, grassroots level, but I don't believe that they can be any more successful in their work than I was in my work. No, as soon as I was removed from Guatemala, Peace Corps was sent into the area that I was in as along with five CIA agents. And uh, let me give you one thing. I went to the governor of Huehuetenango once, and uh, complaints were going out that I was a communist. You know what a communist is in Latin America. It's anyone who is showing any effectiveness in helping the poor. He is labeled a communist. I was labeled communist priest. And uh, I went to the governor once to see if he was believing this and what he was going to do about it and all. And it wasn't bothering him at that time. I guess he didn't think we were going to be too effective. We weren't. Uh, but he said to me, if the people do arise in this area, he, by the way, was trained. He's a Guatemalan army colonel. He's not elected governor. He's named. Every governor of the 23 states, of course, is an army colonel. Now, he was trained in our base in Panama as 85% of the officers of the Guatemalan Army are trained in Panama or here in the United States. He was trained in Panama in intelligence and espionage. And uh, he had been recently named to our state along with the um, head of the counterinsurgency forces. He was trained to, uh, to our state also. When talking to the governor, he said uh, that if the people should arise in the state of Huehuetenango, that he would answer directly to the CIA and he said, what I expect of the Americans working in this state, he's pointing at me, he said, is that they will inform me as to what is happening in the villages. Now the Americans, he said, would be the American priests, Mary Knoll, because we are the only priests in that state, and the Peace Corps. This is what he expected of us. He wouldn't have got it, of course. He would have from some. He would have got it from some priests and some Peace Corps uh, volunteers, I imagine. But he expected that that would be our role when the people, if the people should arise in Huehuetenango, that we would answer directly to him. That's what he hoped for. And he said that he would come on the CIA. The Peace Corps, once again, as I say, is working at grassroots, grassroots level. They are making a contribution. Their work cannot be effective in the existing society. It cannot be effective. They have got to, at the end of their two years period in Guatemala, the people have got to be living in the same misery as they were when Peace Corps arrived. Maybe they were receiving $50 a year income and the Peace Corps has helped raise them up to 75 This is not lifting them out of their unjust conditions. Yes? Very good, thank you. I might add that we were at uh, one of the state colleges here and after the talk, we sat around, had coffee, and three girls came up to me, and they said, we have just come back from Huehuetenango. And I said, what were you doing in Huehuetenango? And they said, we're Peace Corps. We were Peace Corps volunteers. I said, wonderful. Where did you work? They said, Santi Olalia. I know the, way, the place well. I said, what did you do? They said, nothing. We lasted three months and quit. I said, why did you quit? They said, we were representatives of the government. We could not actually be effective in helping the people. This was their words. I met them 10 days ago. Three months they spent in, in Guatemala as Peace Corps workers. I'm sure we'll get uh, the other side of the picture. Maybe someone else can give us the other side where they felt the Peace Corps was effective. 
Yes, ma'am. Uh, the hierarchy in Latin America as the hierarchy here in the United States of the Catholic Church is reactionary. It is not working for the good of the people. I would say from, and I am still a Catholic priest, I feel that I can justly criticize my compadres, compañeros. I feel that from the Pope down, there are very few members of the Catholic hierarchy who are working to better the conditions of the world. I know that the Pope, for example, could be very, very effective, very instrumental in bringing about the end of the Vietnam War if he would only speak to the Catholics of the world. You know, if we had a Pope like John, who not only spoke to the Catholics, but spoke to many non-Catholics of the world, because he was a man dedicated to people. But if Paul, who is not dedicated to people, would speak to the Catholics of the United States and declare the war to be immoral, and not to order them, but simply to recommend that they not participate in this immoral war, the effect that this would have, if we do have 40 million people in this country who call themselves America, uh, Catholics, you know, he does not take that stand. The same with our bishops. It's rare in Latin America that you find a man like Eldor Camara in Brazil, Recife, who is actually putting his head on the chopping block, as they say, you know, taking risks for his people down there. That's rare. Our bishop told us once not to become too involved in social works, that this only brought about problems. And it's true, you can avoid problems. Just keep administering the sacraments. You'll never have a problem. Uh, the Archbishop of Guatemala, he considers himself liberal, very, very conservative. Uh, he preaches and writes beautifully on social reform, but does nothing to help bring it about. He condemned myself and my brother as, once again, communists and antichrists. This was published in the Guatemalan papers. Yes, sister. No, we, I would say, sister, that you and I and our companions are pretty brainwashed. Uh, we're a part of the system that has always stood on the side of power, not on the side of justice. This is the history of the Catholic Church, as in Cuba, backing Batista until we realized Fidel was going to take over. Uh, and then the American mission is and the Spanish mission is moving out. You know, we're not in there today. The Canadians, but I don't know the Canadian people, but the Canadian people made the right decision, the Canadian mission is. You know, they're still there in, in uh, Cuba. I've had a good opportunity to speak to some of them coming out of Cuba now. But uh, we've always put in chaplains, you know, into the army. For example, we consider it heroic today for a priest to go into the United States Army as a chaplain in Vietnam. I consider this a crime, a sin, that a man would do that. A man like Camilo Torres goes into the army as a chaplain. But it's the army that's fighting against the power structure, the unjust structure. He's condemned by the church in Colombia, you know, in general. The church historically has stood on the side of power, whether that power be representative of the people, whether it uh, justly use its power or not. The Catholic church has stood on the side of power. That's the way it is in Latin America today. Yes? Definitely. Definitely. There are several Protestant groups in, in Guatemala that have developed social concern. The, uh, well, if I start to name them, I'm sure I'd leave out one or two, so I won't name them. But of course the friends, well, there I go naming them. I won't name any more. Uh, I feel that they can be no more effective than our own group. They, of course, have um, suffered under the oppression of the Catholic Church, the Catholic structure in Latin America, which is, in Guatemala, the constitutionally recognized religion, unfortunately. And uh, the hierarchy, of course, uses this uh, political power that it does have for its own ends. And Protestant groups have suffered because of the uh, Catholic structure in Latin America. They are working on social levels, there's no doubt about it, nutritional programs, medical programs, uh, cooperative works. Yes. Sir? Yes? Um, I also Educate the American. <laughs>
That may well be. Mm -hmm. You don't see collaboration with the CIA. Well, that is not seen. I mean, no, I see Ray Bill Watt still down in Florida, but usually young Americans were wherever they were. Yeah. But, you know, if we go back and reevaluate the system again, is the existing government working for change? Does it represent justice? Does it represent distribution of the wealth? Can we go along with it? Do you feel it would be better to not to have any kind of foreign presence whatsoever, even though it is organized and it's pure and it is thinking about a kind of revolutionary concept? Do you feel it's a different kind of Let me tell you what uh, one Guatemalan revolutionary intellectual said once. He was a university student. And at a rally once, he read a poem that he had written. A beautiful poem. It was about the gringos. And in part of it, he was saying, take your surplus corn and powdered milk, take your bridges and your highway, take your schools and your so-called loans and get out and let Guatemala be free. Uh, I would say that the question that you are asking should be answered affirmatively and that it would be the ideal that until our system here changes in the United States, we're going to continue to exploit and contain. That uh, Alianza, Alliance, for example, was set up because President Kennedy felt that the Cuban idea and ideal was getting a foothold in Latin America. That uh, we actually have been selfish in our work that uh, I think that also Kennedy was probably trying to sell American ways and American thought to the Latin through the Peace Corps. Many are doing, as you say, probably helping to bring about the revolutionary conditions necessary through organization. But at the same time, the system behind it all, I don't think, is highly motivated. Certainly a first step, if we are to be if uh, a country such as Latin America is to liberate itself, one of the first steps would be military withdrawal. Yes, sir? Are there any U.S. Special Forces personnel in Guatemala? Definitely. There are Green Berets. No one can t give you that figure today. All I can say is that in 1966, a General Porter testified before an Armed Services Committee that at that time there were 1,000 in Guatemala. It has been stepped up since then. I don't know how many. Definitely. Guatemalan villages have been napalmed by planes leaving Panama, unmarked planes. This, once again, the Vice President uh, Maroquin Rojas, who is also working for the containment of the people, the present Vice President of Guatemala, uh, he once again is subject to United States domination. But he criticized the United States very much on that point and publicly that our planes were leaving Panamanian bases, unmarked, napalming uh, Guatemalan villages. Yes, I have talked to people who, I have not seen the napalming, but I have talked to people who have seen it, seen it its effects. I also have connection uh, indirectly with a Guatemalan colonel who made one of the flights over Guatemala, not napalming, but bombing. Yes? <coughs> Excuse me, I couldn't hear you. At this point, there would be, uh, of course, the direction at this point would fall mainly upon uh, Guatemalan army officers who have been trained in the United States and have passed over to the uh, revolutionary forces. Guatemalans, Guatemalans themselves. Yes, there is no foreigner in the movement. I was the first one to be invited into the movement as a foreigner. The, uh, then the university students, of course, are playing quite a role in it, and the peasants are entering slowly. The oppression against the peasant is tremendous when, if one leaves his village, the oppression that falls upon his village at this point is very harsh. Yes? Well, let's say that it did turn into another Cuba. Well, you know, I say that these people have got to be free to determine their own future. I know that Castro and the people who were... Uh, setting up the new government on the island did not want to, t to take the uh, road that they have taken today, that we forced them into it. There is no doubt about that at all. 
Now, when you say communist, I suppose what you actually mean to say is Marxist, Leninist, uh, not just communist. Because, I mean, if we are to educate ourselves and understand what is going on in the world, we can never condemn communism. You know, communism in itself is beautiful. It's beautiful, the system of communism. I mean, I believe in Christ and Christian principles, and I would say that Christ was a communist. He certainly was not a Marxist or a Leninist. But if Guatemala was to go communist, to bring about communal, uh, a communal life for those people there, you know, cooperative living, this would be the ideal for them, there's no doubt about that. Yes? Are you against the, the American um, um, idea of private industry, or in particular, in, in this case, or against the religion which we've been using in our politics? Um, and well, certainly, uh, free enterprise here in the United States has gone wild. You know, we have an overpowerful capitalistic system here today. I suppose we could go back and find somewhere along the line where capitalism was benefiting the peoples of this country. It has been an oppressor in countries of the third world for a long time now, you know. The uh, Latin America, or Guatemala, to speak specifically, received its independence from Spain in 1821. They say they became a colony of the United States in 1822. We come out with the Monroe Doctrine in 1823, which, of course, declares that no Asian or European power can come into Latin America. It says nothing about the North American power going into Latin America. <coughs> Political and economic. Mm -hmm. Jim? Do you feel that uh, this, this type of uh, communal uh, living would evolve into a, a private uh, enterprise system, say, uh, relating this to uh, American history, how we had a type of communal living in our early colonial period, and we've moved uh, you know, from that. I suppose any system is going to evolve, even as our own has, you know? There was a time when, when we could consider our government, for example, here, democratically elected. But all systems evolve, some of them for the better, some of them for the worse. Uh, how the system in a uh, system in a country such as Guatemala, if you did have a communal system set up there, how it would evolve in the future, it certainly is not going to remain stagnant. It is going to continue to change. What will come about in the future, I'm not capable of saying. What I should say, and I believe we all should say, is let Guatemalans determine what their future is going to be. We talk about developing their country. We're not capable of developing their country. We don't understand them. We don't understand their mentality, nor their culture or their language, and yet we try to impose upon them our system and our culture. I think that we've got to work towards the liberation of Latin America, as we should work towards the liberation of Vietnam, and let the Vietnamese or the Latins determine their own future, and not try to continue imposing our system. Let's see. Sister. Some, yeah. When I say many, it would be a good group, but uh, of course it would not be uh, a large percentage of the university. Yes, go ahead. Sister, they believe themselves that they are capable of doing it, of bringing about the change. If we were to withdraw, which for them would be the ideal, if we were to withdraw militarily from Guatemala, all military support, they still feel that they would have to go through their revolution, but that they would be capable of handling it. As several have said, if we continue on with the existing foreign policy, it will probably take them as long to liberate themselves as it is taking the Vietnamese. But if we were to withdraw, they could bring it about in a relatively short time. That is their own belief. Jim. It seems somewhat odd to me, uh, maybe you can comment on this, this uh, statement, that uh, the university students in Guatemala are probably their education being subsidized by the up upper class and then themselves coming from the upper class be so interested in, in El Campo. Well, we see that happening here in the United States also. Yeah, you do have sons of the oligarchical class fighting in the mountains, dying in the mountains, there's no doubt about it. Uh, but you find that same dissatisfaction among people of the oligarchical class here, university students who have, I suppose, lived materially very highly, yet at the same time are throwing off this material wealth 
in order to look for a fulfillment in something else. We did have, of course, the uh, tremendous advantage of having university students working in the campo before entering into the guerrilla movement. Now, this is quite a reversal from what has happened in the past, where university students have gone into the guerrilla movement and then gone out and tried to make contact and win the confidence of the peasants. And it was a little bit reversed here, where they were giving up their university studies, some of them, because they were entering in so much into the life of the peasant people, and then entering into the guerrilla movement with the confidence established. It was quite a reversal. Yes? They definitely are, yes. Mm -hmm. Once again, I would say that uh, for the cleric, the Guatemalan cleric, native, it is more difficult for him to come to this decision than a person like myself. Of course, the, the younger cleric today is quite different from generation ahead of us, you know. But uh, the clergy in Guatemala, of course, they have come from families, many who have not had material wealth in the past. They come into what we call the religious life. They now do dress well, they eat well, they have a car. It's difficult to throw that off if you pass through a period of your life without having these things. And then you finally encounter them. Then to throw them off again is a difficult decision. More difficult than a person like myself. I who have always eaten well and dressed well and always had a car. And then to make the decision just to do away with these things, it's a lot easier for me. There are among the uh, native element men who are dedicating themselves to the revolutionary movement, yes. So you foreseen any possibility of the church Yeah. You talk about the Guatemalan church, and then you talk about elements of the Brazilian church. And I would say let's make a, a good parallel, elements in the Guatemalan church and elements in the Brazilian church. There will be elements in the Guatemalan church also who will participate in, the, in bringing about the change. The change, of course, in civil society in Guatemala is going to bring about a radical change in the Catholic Church. I don't think it will be recognizable in the future after the, the Catholic Church uh, as the Catholic Church as we know it today. I can see the need, the great need, for so many changes in the Church. You know, the, for example, if there is a priesthood, priesthood coming from the people, not the priest being imposed upon the people, but the people themselves developing their priests or their leaders, be they religious or not. You know, there are so many needs, uh, so many great uh, changes needed in the church. And these will come about, I have no doubt about it. That the, um, for example, right now, today, the Latin is overthrowing the old Catholic idea of fatalism. You know, suffering now, uh, patience, bear with it, enjoy the beatific vision later on. Uh, no, no. They still want the beatific vision later on, but they realize now that there is a chance of overcoming the unjust suffering that is imposed upon them in this life. Not that we can, any of us can get away from suffering, you know, but we can prevent others from imposing it upon us. Now, uh, I would say the, this Catholic idea is changing in Latin America. That would be one thing. How do you reconcile the belief in the Christian doctrine and your uh, opinions as, as far as violence is concerned and revolution? My opinions on violence or revolution have not changed. Those who are in the movement today would not consider themselves in a violent movement. They, once again, this comes from the intellectual uh, element of the revolution, they would define violence as the violation of the rights of an individual or society. And that the masses <coughs> are having their rights violated by the minority. And they simply today are defending themselves against the violence, but they are exercising a right in defending themselves and defending their society. They are not violating the rights of any other person. They call it the armed revolution. They refuse to call it the violent revolution. My opinion on violence has not changed at all. I, in entering into this movement, or in planning on entering into it, was simply trying to make my contribution to its justice, the defense of the rights of a society. 
they have a right to, to defend themselves against an unjust oppressor. This is a Christian principle. I was simply standing on it. Yes, sir. I read a statement by your brother Thomas Melville in Seed Oaks report on why he and you have done what you have done. And I think that statement was reproduced in a United States Catholic tabloid paper called North America Call. I'd be interested in knowing what reaction there has been in the United States Catholic Church to uh, you, what you and your brother have done, especially as it has been expressed in that statement? Well, the reaction among the clergy of this country? I, mean the general Roman Catholic. I would say in this country we had the support of the majority of Catholics in entering into the revolution. Uh, I would say that Catholics here certainly would be in favor of revolution in the participation of American priests if they would be invited by Latin people to participate, participating in the Latin revolution. And they are in favor of this because I suppose it's uh, considered a rather heroic work, you know, uh, and at the same time it is not affecting them in any way. When uh, we started criticizing the United States as the great oppressor, as the prime enemy uh, of Latin America, and now we don't have the Catholic population with us, but as long as we were down there saying, and they had the idea that what we were doing was uh, aligning ourselves with the people against the oligarchical class, well, that was great. But when you align yourself with the oppressed peoples of the world against our society here, this isn't so good. You know, Tom, my brother Tom, and Marge, my sister-in-law, with the two fathers, Berrigan, and with a Christian brother, and with another Marian old brother, and with a nurse who had just come back from volunteering two years in Africa, and with an ex-State Department worker who got fed up over the Dominican Republic deal down there. The nine of them threw napalm on draft records in, in Baltimore. I consider that a pretty heroic work. They went into it, you know, directly opposing the establishment. They went into it knowing that they were going to be sentenced. You know, it wasn't just that they imprudently entered into this. Now, this is not the work of, of a priest, you know. This is what we're told by the Catholic people today. Uh, this is not the role of a priest. Uh, you broke a law, you know. And they don't go back to try to consider if this law is just or not. You know, they don't go back to the Geneva Accords to see if uh, we injustice can be in Vietnam. If we injustice can have uh, an army today in Vietnam if we can have the selective service system that we do have, uh, if they went back and started studying logically and intelligently uh, what our military system is and what it represents, then they would say, well, we as Christians have got to throw napalm on draft records. But because of the tremendous brainwashing, because of the closed propaganda system that we have here in the United States, they have not been able to think that far back. A Catholic priest, this would be the general opinion, you're asking of general opinion. The general opinion is, well, hurrah for the Catholic priest that uh, participates in the Latin Revolution, but don't come back here and try and bring about any change. Yes, sir. Catholics, how, well, let's talk uh, more specifically, you know, how do I as a Catholic view civil law? I, res I represent all legitimate authority. I represent, I would uh, obey and demand that others obey all law that does exist for the common good. Definitely. I, in an individual case, have got to determine for myself if a law is just or not. In an individual case, I have got to determine that. And, and I am still bound by my own conscience. And if the of the have that will not then I have got to consider possibly that I am making an imprudent judgment. I've got to consider that if the majority of the people uh, do consider me to be in error. Mm -hmm. Yes.
Well, I couldn't judge their motivation, of course. What you're saying is true, that we have been forced to reevaluate uh, our interpretation of the scriptures. The existing structured church in a new society will have very little relevancy. <laughs> the existing structure. Now, it is up to the people to determine for themselves. If a God does exist, if we should worship, if we should have liturgy, then we ourselves have got to form it. It does not have to be imposed upon us, by, especially by the existing structure. Then the church will be relevant when it comes from the people. But of course, uh, what you're saying about the Catholic Church is we can draw a parallel with the United States government, State Department, with ourselves, you know. We never lifted a hand for Latin America until someone convinced us of this big red bugaboo, you know. Same thing. We didn't uh, even put up this false fronts of Alliance for Progress until we were forced to by what we call the opposing camp. Yes. Very good, very good. All right, what, what should we be doing then, we who are capable yet of expressing ourselves openly and freely as the Guatemalan isn't? What, what uh, camino, what road should we be taking? Now that may well be, you know, that the right is writing more than the left. Uh, however, I would have to doubt the statistics that the United States government would give out on uh, number of letters received in favor of the law, you know, and of the war. I mean, the credibility gap for me on something like that is pretty wide. Uh, how we would uh, prove how many letter writers are in favor of the war or against it would be a pretty difficult thing to determine. However, at the same time, your conclusion is that more of us who would be against the war should be writing. It's true. Of course, when the black people arouse a little fear in the middle white class, middle class uh, white society, then you know we stopped and listened to them. Uh, Martin Luther King walked and talked for ten years, and we really got didn't get too far, I don't believe. But as soon as we became a little bit afraid, well, they've got a, a platform now. Uh, but I'd like someone else to to. Uh, talk along the same line this gentleman here is maybe a, a criticism did you want to say something
Well, you know, we do have one thing, we do have the invisible government here. Another thing is that the government which sits in Washington may not be the power that it pretends to be. You know, it we may possibly have a an industrial military power that is greater and more effective than our existing government. How do we go about uh, bringing about effective changes in this, if this is true? Who would like to say something on that? Sister. One thing that we know we've got to do is to inform ourselves more and to help other people inform themselves. We know that to bring about a change, we have got to have, well, masses of people. You don't have to have the majority of people to bring about change, but you have to have solidarity, you have to have organization, and you have to have a well-informed group. Now, we ourselves, I know that each of us here who, if we could come to an agreement, common belief about our existing system here, we are obliged to help inform other people, not inform them on a superficial level, but to make profound investigation of what we are living here, of what we are living in here, and of what our system is provoking in the United States and in other countries. Certainly, information is of the essence to start with. Uh, pardon me, Father Melville. Uh, at this time, I... I I want to say that we, we should try and draw the discussion to a conclusion in the next couple of minutes. Uh, our time has run out, and I'm sure we have other places to go and other things to do. Um, and uh, we have a luncheon plan for Father Melville that we want to go through with also. And so if, if you can bring your comments to him individually, uh, we can draw this to a conclusion with a couple of more questions. That's okay. Okay, a couple more then. Let's have someone else on saying what we should do or what we can do as members of the society, the system. Okay. Anyone else? Yes.
Yeah, its operation in Guatemala, I don't believe, is too big as compared to other Latin countries. I don't have statistics here. When you were uh, when you brought up International Nickel, I was thinking that uh, I'd have to grab you afterwards and see how much you had on statistics. Maybe you could help us along this line through your friend without telling him why we want the statistics. <laughs> maybe uh, maybe you could make an investigation on this and we'll give you an address here, people you can get in contact with with this information. Would you do it? All right. Uh, I'm very sorry, but this time I'm going to draw it to a close. I'm, uh, I'd like you to join me in thanking Father Melville for his presentation today. It's been very interesting. Thank you. Thank you.